Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. Now, if you have any questions throughout the session, this is a pre-recorded session this week. So if you're on Zoom, just reply to the confirmation email that you received. That'll go to our inbox and I can answer those questions. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, just uh, leave a comment underneath the video. And then if you're on Facebook, just leave a comment under the video as well. And I'll get to those questions as soon as possible. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm a Snap-on's National Diagnostic Technical Trainer. Been in the training department about the last 10 years, traveling around North America, helping Tapscan shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep with Snap-on. So I had about 30 different franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before I did that, it was eight years at Subaru. So I was a technician at a dealership, and I guess over time just became the default dyad guy in the shop. So I always ended up with the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come into my bay. And before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. Our topic today is vehicle network communication overview and diagnosis. Now, I know that vehicle network communication systems uh, are a pretty hot topic, just evidenced by how many views we get on YouTube just for those uh, videos that we've done in the past for these. So this is going to be a good overview and diagnosis kind of combined into one. We'll talk about a few different network types and, and how they're laid out and how they work. And then uh, we'll just get into some more uh, actual diagnosis as we go. So let's start at the beginning, a network. Let's define what a network is. So a network is a system that utilizes information through all available resources. So any modules or nodes that are connected to each other can use information from each other. For example, if a transmission control module needed a wheel speed sensor input from the ABS control module, they can get that information over the network. Now, there's a few types of networks that you may already know and be aware of that you probably use day in and day out. Uh, first one is LAN. So that's a local area network. So that'd be kind of like your network in your shop, your Wi-Fi, as, you, as it were. Uh, and then there's WAN, which is wide area networks. So that's multiple LANs connected to each other. And that's just a really fancy way, I guess, of describing the internet, just a wide area network. Now, the types of networks that we deal with in the automotive industry, we're going to talk about CAN, which just stands for controller area network, not car area network like some folks might think, but it's actually controller area network. It's used in more than automobiles, it's used in factories and so on as well. Uh, then we have LIN, local interconnect network. That's a kind of a single wire bus, uh, point to point. And then DOIP, which is kind of a fairly newer protocol. That's diagnostics over IP. That's ethernet uh, that you might be seeing out there in some vehicles as well. Now, what a network does is it works on what we would call a voltage differential. What is the difference in voltage between the high side and the low side of the signal? And it's going to vary depending on what the specifications are for that type of network. So in this example, we're looking at a LIN bus, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but what LIN works on is about a 12 volt differential. Now, you see it does not go down to zero, and it's over 12 volts here at the top. But the difference between the top and the bottom is about 12 volts. They usually give you a little, uh, you know, a little bit of room either side of that, uh, just to give you a, a just, just, just kind of as a buffer, right? So it's about 12 volts. So you, you know, it's not necessarily going to be 12 volts to zero. It could be anywhere in that range. This one happens to be uh, off an alternator, so it's, it's actually has to be running. So you're going to see alternator voltage about 14ish volts, 13.35 uh, in this case. Uh, down to 0.91, which gives us a 12 volt differential there. So different types of communication networks that you'll find on cars, and we'll talk about a fair number of these today. Uh, low speed networks, it's gonna be kind of your earlier networks. Uh, J1850, we have both variable pulse width and pulse width modulated type signals. We'll take a look at what those look like. We also have K-Line, which is uh, pretty common on uh, Japanese cars, you know, Asian vehicles. Uh, LIN bus, which is going to be used uh, fairly commonly on, on many cars nowadays. CAN bus, of course, that's uh, very, pretty much the standard. Then we have CAN FD, which is a faster version of CAN. We'll talk about that because that seems to be uh, coming up a lot in conversation lately. Uh, FlexRay, most, which is a media 
transport's used a lot for uh, like audio and video in the vehicle. And then Ethernet, which is that diagnostics over IP, which some vehicles use now. Um, and some vehicles also use it internally as well. Uh, really, it's going to start at the diagnostic link connector. So your data data link connector. So this is since 96, 1996. This has been standardized across uh, pretty much the world. So pin one can be used for low speed CAN communications. I've seen that on GM especially. Uh, pin two is going to be your J1850 variable pulse width. That would be a single wire network. Once again, often used by GM. And then we have J1850 pulse width modulated positive, which matches with the pin 10 negative. So those are standardized pins. That's where they would be. Um, sometimes now on modern vehicles, when we're not using those lower speed networks, we also may find CAN bus on some of these other pins too. But we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, so J1850 variable pulse width is single wire. J1850 pulse width modulated is two wire. That was often used by Ford back in the day. Uh, pin 4 and 5 are ground, so one's for scan tool, one's for common signal. Pin 6 and 14, that's going to be your main CAN bus. So CAN bus can be on other pins. You're going to have to look at the uh, wiring diagrams, and we'll talk more about that as we go. Uh, but your main network with your engine, transmission, body control, that's all going to be on pin 6 and 14. Pin 7 is going to be your keyword or uh, K line. And then uh, keyword L line, sometimes that shows up if, if they do a, a two wire on that one as well, pin seven and 15. Uh, pin 16 is always power. So really, if, if you know you have power and you know you have ground, that's a good place to start. If you do not have power here, that's probably where you're gonna wanna start because uh, a lot of that is usually linked to uh, the ECM, it, it, the you know very uh, same fuse or provides power from the ECM in that case. So let's talk about single wire networks real quick talked about J1850. So the J1850 variable pulse width bus consists of a single wire with a transmission rate of about 10 kilobits per second. So this one's the, kind of the slowest of them all. Uh, J1850 variable pulse width uses a seven volt differential. So you'll see seven volts of, uh, difference between the top and the bottom. Uh, J1850 pulse width modulated bus is a two wire bus with a transmission rate of 41 kilobits per second. And that uses a five volt differential. So if you were to look it on the screen, you would see a five volt difference. So here's the case of the variable pulse width. You can see it goes up to about seven volts at the top, zero volts at the bottom in this case, and that would be on pin two. Uh, J1850 pulse width modulated, we can see we got about five-ish volts right there, 4.3, 4.5 on this particular vehicle. And you'll see when uh, one channel goes high, the other one goes low at the same time, they kind of mirror each other. So that's your ones and zeros, your bits and bytes going back and forth on the, uh, on, on the different legs of that, right? So we can see uh, how it kind of goes up and down. Then there's K-Line. So K-Line consists of a single wire with a transmission rate of around 10 kilobits per second as well. So that's gonna be very similar to your uh, J1850. And then in this case, it uses a 10 volt differential. So here's a K-Line here, and this is off of, uh, actually off of my Subaru. So um, Subaru is kind of weird. Not to go off on a tangent about Subaru, but uh, they have both CAN bus and K-Line for their diagnostics. It kind of depends on the age of the vehicle. Uh, my vehicle happens to have both. So it has, uh, has K-Line for diagnostics and it has CAN bus because it has to have CAN bus because that's a standard too. Um, so in this case, we were able to pull the K-Line right off and you can see it's a 10 volt differential square waves. Uh, when you see an up, that's a one. And when you see it down, that's a zero. So ones and zeros. On and off, that's that's your data. Then we have LIN bus. So LIN was specially developed to achieve cost-effective communication for intelligent sensors and actuators in motor vehicles. So it is a master and a slave, or it could be multiple slaves. They, they can just be kind of daisy chained together. Uh, so it's going to send digital data. It's not really an on-off. It's going to send digital data back and forth between, say, a window switch and a window motor. It's not going to tell it to turn on. It's going to tell the module to turn it on. Uh, so it's just it's just sending uh, data back and forth. It's used wherever we don't need band the bandwidth and versatility of CAN. We don't need to send a lot of information. It's really just more of an on-off, up-down type thing. Um, it consists of a single wire with a transmission rate of up to 20 kilobits per second, and it uses a 12-volt differential like we saw earlier in the presentation. So some examples of where you'd see that is roof. 
So light sensors, light control, sunroof, steering wheel controls for sure, seat controls, engine, little small motors, grill shutters, climate control, doors, mirrors, central ECUs, mirror switch, windows, lift, seat controls, etc. So it's all those little switches and motors is pretty much what it boils down to they use Lin. Uh, and there's the example of the Lin signal again, about a 12 volt differential. You can see all the ones and zeros going back and forth in those little data packs. So that's that's the uh that's the gist of these data networks is that they're they're gonna send bits and bytes, ones and zeros back and forth. That's all a computer really knows is on or off, binary, one or zero. Uh, so it sends ones and zeros in a certain combination and the computer can decode that and figure out what that actually means. And then we get to CAN. So CAN is pretty much your standard nowadays. Uh, it's been standardized since about 08. Uh, High-speed CAN consists of two twisted wires with a transmission rate of 100 to 500 kilobits per second. That's standard CAN. Uh, there is some higher speed uh, CAN that can get up to 1,000 kilobits or one megabit. One signal circuit is identified as CAN high and the other signal circuit is identified as CAN low. At each end of the data bus is a 120 ohm termination resistor between the CAN high and CAN low circuits. And that uh, kind of is your stopping point at the end of the uh, the bus. So this is an oversimplified drawing of a CAN bus. But as you can see, we got termination resistors on both sides. Oftentimes, that resistor can reside inside a control module. Now, if you want to test a network, uh, you want to ohm it if you want to ohm it out because there's not a lot you can do with a meter. You really need to use a scope, and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but if you wanted to use a meter and you wanted to ohm out the lines, then you could uh, you would you would plug in at six and fourteen on the uh, DLC. You want to make sure the power is off to the vehicle, otherwise uh, that can skew your number, and you should see sixty ohms because one hundred and twenty ohms. And a multimeter is going to take the average between the two lines that it's reading, so one hundred twenty ohms on each. Divide that by two, you get 60 ohms. So it should be about 60 ohms when everything's working. If you get 120 ohms, you got a problem. Uh, it's going to be kind of an open or a short. So uh, nice thing about CAN bus, though, is it's just, it's a modular network. I can add modules to the network, and they will start communicating you know, as long as they're programmed properly. I can add a few more modules if I want to. Um, there is a limit. Not 100% sure of how, to, how I would quantify the limit. But once you get too many modules on the same network, you're going to have data collisions. You're going to have a lot of uh, uh, like a like a uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, like a traffic jam, right? You'll have a traffic jam of data, and things might not necessarily be be able to go where they need to go in the time that they need to get there. So what some manufacturers have done is they've actually split out multiple CAN buses on a vehicle, and we'll see that a little bit later when we look at some wiring diagrams. Um, but by and large, you can add modules up until that, whatever that point is, uh, even take a few away. You can take all the modules away. You can have just one module on this CAN bus connected to the data link connector, and it'll still communicate uh, and it'll still transmit data, even though it doesn't need to share it with anything else. You'll still be able to communicate with it. At the same time. Uh, and if I was going to look at a CAN bus pattern on a vehicle, this is kind of what it's going to look like. So ones and zeros. Bits and bytes on and off. We'll analyze this a little bit more uh, when we get to the live portion of the program. But as I said, main bus is on pin 6 and 14 on the DLC. You could also go directly to the module as long as you knew where those CAN wires went to. Uh, depending on the complexity of the network, you may need to actually go to the module directly. That brings us to CAN FD. So CAN FD has been... Um, a topic of conversation over the last year or so, at least in my life. Um, so CAN FD, what that is, it stands for Controller Area Network, which is CAN. FD stands for Flexible Data Rate. So it, it's able to send more data with the same basic structure. So it's structurally identical to traditional CAN. You're going to have twisted pair of wires. You're going to have 120 ohm termination resistors. But due to the way the data is structured, it can carry more data and it can be faster. Uh, on average, it's going to be anywhere from three to eight times faster than traditional CAN. But going back to that structurally identical part, you can mix CAN FD and regular CAN modules on the same network. So that's the beauty of the CAN FD. So it just allows the manufacturers to send more data at a faster rate while still using 
the base uh, can structure that they're used to. Um, we don't need to get too deep into it, too, too into the weeds here. But if we look at the top part, that is what a uh, CAN bus data frame would look like. Right, So we can see the uh, start and the end, the data field. Uh, data length code, all of that stuff. And th this is like, you know, electronics engineers, programmers type thing uh, would be worried more about this. But um, the big change is kind of in the middle here uh, where they're going to change the, uh, it's going to allow them to change the the rate of the bits and, and so on. It also allows for better error correction. So we can see a lot of it's the same up until it gets to this middle part. And then the end part is going to be the same too. So if you were to look at this with a scope, if you're used to looking at a regular CAN bus, it's going to look pretty much the same. It just might be a little bit more, you know, it might be a little longer in length, um, but it's it's going, and it might be a little bit faster. So the frequency might be a little bit uh, closer together, but essentially they communicate in the same way. So you really don't need to change a whole lot when it comes to those vehicles, and even when it comes to scan tools. So I know that some other scan tool manufacturers that are not Snap-on uh, have these uh, CAN FD adapters that you can buy, you know, wherever, Amazon or whatever. Uh, and they say they're for 2018 and up GM and Ford vehicles. Well, what they don't tell you is it's not for the North American market, at least right now. And as far as I know, it's not in Europe either. So since they, the other manufacturers make global tools, that the same tool will work pretty much anywhere in the world, so in certain countries, you may need that adapter. So I know uh, in Latin America, South America, pretty much Mexico down south, there are some vehicles that use CAN-FT that go to communicate directly to the scan tool. Otherwise, uh, like in North America, above Mexico and the UK, uh, there are no vehicles that use CAN-FT to communicate with the scan tool directly, like a direct interface where you would need that. However, I know this is this uh, has a global audience. So if you are in one of those countries that has these cars, for example, this is a Chevy Onyx right here. That's only available down in Latin America, Brazil, what have you. Um, and you would need the software, of course, to communicate with that vehicle anyways. But in those cases, depending on the tool, you may need an adapter and the adapter would be available. But since there's none of these vehicles up here in North America, we don't sell it in North America, but it would be available. To any of these other folks so if you have an apollo d9 a triton d10 solus plus or the s9 scan module that came with the zeus plus or the uh second iteration of the zeus the black one you don't need an adapter it's included in the software it's built into the chip so you don't have to worry about it anything else like in a like a either of the d8s solus legend solus edge modus edge any of those needs an adapter cable and it's just a simple it looks just like if you've ever seen the ethernet cable where it's got the big fill in the middle uh, the adapter cable would be required for that. It's just a, it'd be a separate part number. It's not the same as the Ethernet cable. It's a separate cable. And it would tell you what cable you would need on the tool. I know I got a message from a franchisee that was in uh, South Texas a couple months ago. And they said, hey, you know, a customer is plugging in with the tool and it, and it says it needs this adapter. And I said, well, we don't have the adapter available in North America. And I said, what kind of car is it? And he said, well, it's a Chevy Onyx said okay well they don't make those up here so it must have came up from mexico or what have you and uh really nothing we can do because you would need the specific scan tool software for that vehicle anyways which is not also in the the uh u.s canada market so um not sure how they how they fared after that but it, just be aware that they are around but they're not necessarily supported on north american software u.s and canada software I do know Mexico is in North America. Uh, here's just an example of what you would find in a U.S. vehicle. So uh, this is a 2023 Mustang Mach-E, and that uses um, CAN-FD. But it uses CAN-FD inside the car, not communicating with the uh, scan tool. So we see on the scan tool here, we have two channels of CAN. Uh, the pins uh, 6 and 14 and 3 and 11. Like I said, mo uh, some manufacturers use multiple CAN buses to the diagnostic connector but there's a diagnostic connector there then you can see it goes into the gateway module and we see we have diag one can and diag two can those are two channels of can and then we have mid-speed can we have some high-speed cans internally and then we have high-speed can fd 
right there. So those go to uh, some uh, a few modules. We'll take a look at this wiring diagram in a little bit when we go live. Uh, but you can see it's high-speed CAN inside. There's other vehicles. They use Ethernet internally. They don't communicate with the scan tool with it. Uh, not sure why they haven't made that change. It's probably for their own factory scan tools to not have to worry about updating, I would suppose. Uh, but they are out there in certain places in the world, just so you're aware. Uh, as of right now, as of fall of 2023, you really don't need to worry about it too much in U.S., Canada, U.K. All right, and then there's FlexRay. So FlexRay has actually been around for quite some time as well. Mainly used in European cars. Uh, but the FlexRay bus consists of two twisted wires with a transmission rate of up to 10 megabits per second. So that is the fastest by far out of any of the networks we talked about today. And I think because of that, because of the speed, it only has a one volt differential. So it's 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 turning on and off ones and ones and zeros. Very, very fast. Very similar to CAN. Uh, it has a signal high and a signal low is what they call it. And then at the end of each data bus, there's an 80 to 100 ohm termination resistor. Depends on what the manufacturer put in there. So there's a little bit of leeway in the spec as to what they can use for a resistor. And you can see it's it's kind of like CAN, but it's very very small when it, when it comes to the uh, ups and downs of those of those data packets, right? So we're getting progressively smaller, and it's more because of the speed, I believe, because and that's why it's it's a much smaller uh, pattern. So now let's talk gateway modules, because I already kind of mentioned it earlier on that Mach-E, right? But for data to be sent between different networks on a vehicle, like high-speed, low-speed CAN, mid-speed CAN, CAN FD, whatever uh, networks on a vehicle, you need to use a gateway module. There also may be multiple gateway modules on a vehicle. You would want to refer to whatever manufacturer's wiring diagram. Another way to think about it is these modules are the router on the vehicle's network. So they're going to route the signals where they might need to go. So this is an example on like, uh, I think it was an Impala. So we see all these uh, in the red box are on the high speed network. The green boxes are on the low speed network. And then the body control module in this case is the translator between those. We've got the diagnostic connector here. We see all the diag wires go in here and then it sends the signal to wherever it needs to go, either the high speed or the low speed bus. Speaking of speed and bus, so uh, GM, has announced uh, a little while ago, it announced in 2019 actually, so that's like four years ago now, uh, GM's digital vehicle platform. So this is their new platform that they've been using the last few years. It debuted in the uh, 2020 Cadillac CT5, and it's pretty much in most GM vehicles at this point. The capability of this system is capable of processing four and a half terabytes of data per hour, and that is a five, in five times increase over what they were using before uses Ethernet internally inside the vehicle up to 10 gigabits per second. And it also offers over the air updates to the car. So you may not be flashing vehicles nearly as much anymore, at least on these GM vehicles. So let's talk about testing networks using your scope. Because you, if you are going to test a network, test for the integrity, look at the signal, you really need to use a scope to do this. Uh, so you need to have a high sampling rate lab scope. So use the lab scope feature in your snap on scan tool if you have it. Uh, access the pins at the DLC connector for the network you're working on. I recommend using a breakout box to lessen pin damage. You don't want to front probe it. And you don't want to back probe it. Uh, set the voltage scale to 10 volts to start. And then set the sweep time at 100 microseconds. You may need to adjust depending on what the signal looks like. But that's pretty much where it's a good place to start. And there's an example of one of the breakout boxes we have. We also have some that are more fancy with voltage readings and lights and stuff. This is the basic one, the YA11167. And uh, like you see here, we're just, uh, in this case, we're at power and ground, but you would see six and 14. You can just plug in right there for your CAN bus or whatever other bus you need to access on the vehicle. And it's gonna look something like this. When you're looking at CAN bus, you'll just see some, some signals going by in between the high and the lows. So it's gonna look kind of like that. If you wanna put your trigger in there, it's gonna move a lot less, but... Um, what we're concerned with is the high range and the low range. So the voltage reading should be between two and a half to 3.75 volts on can high. And then uh, two and a half volts is going to be your idle state. And then anything two and a half volts down to one and a quarter volts is going to be your low side. So uh, idle speed is going to be in the middle. So that's your ones. And then your zeros are going to be your pulses back and forth. And then when it stops communicating, it's going to go back. 
Uh, so like I said, we're only interested in the top and the bottom. So anything over two and a half to 3.75. Uh, so it's going to be from here to here. Anything over that's going to be bad. Anything under this is going to be bad as well. So really your range is going to be 3.75 to about one and a quarter more, give or take. Now, if I have a lot of noise, if I have corrupted data inside, uh, it's going to drop off the packets. Even though there's electromagnetic interference disturbing these packets, the network will still communicate. It's just not going to communicate with whoever's sending that dirty data there. So if I saw a lot of noise in the signal, that's bad. It's going to cause intermittent malfunctions, and it could cause U-code. If the packets are weak, if you see some big ones, and then you see some that are kind of smaller and don't look quite right, uh, it could be an internal short to ground on the controller. If that happens, the controller's packets are going to drop off and they're going to stop asking for information, cause intermittent function, uh, and U codes. So, on the high side, if we have a short to power, it's going to be up maybe about five volts. If it's normal, like we said, the top will be 3.75 volts. If it's shorted to ground, that'll be down around zero volts. If it's out of range, it's going to be controller issue. Same thing with the low side. It can be short to the ground. It can be normal. It can be short to power. And then uh, we could also have both do the same thing. So both could be short to the ground. Both could be normal. Both could be short to power. And then we could have just one side short to ground or one side short to power would happen as well. Uh, it just kind of depends on where the short is in the line. So for example, low errors, short to ground, could be an internal short to power or ground. Uh, abnormal control, these are all over the place, not really mirrored at all. So they're kind of up and down and all around. Um, it's going to drop whatever requests. So sometimes if it decides to stop communicating, you may not be able to see them all the time. But when it's sending erroneous data, you'll be able to see. Uh, if it shorts the ground one side, you can see we got the high side shorted to ground. It's still going to communicate, but at a lower frequency. Same thing with the low side. If the low side does, it switches to a lower frequency. And then if both sides are shorted to ground, it's usually no communication at all. Most likely a result of physical damage, like the like the wires have been cut, or you know maybe kind of an accident and got pinched and, and and severed there. So if you have no communication at all, that's a good place to start. So let's look at a case study about a bus problem. So we have this old five Chevy Silverado, and it had an intermittent hard shifting problem, and it was like very very intermittent. It will intermittently shift hard, and then when it's happening like that, it'll also act like it's constantly in third gear from a stop. Like It takes a long time to get off the line, right? Comes and goes at random. Doesn't depend on weather conditions, time of operation, or anything. It can be hot, can be cold, can be snowy, can be wet, can be dry, can be driving for an hour. Uh, it happened to be on this day. It didn't do anything until he got to me, which was nice. So he was kind of driving. We were meeting up in a parking lot, and I uh, was Drove an hour and nothing happened. And then he got, as soon as he pulled in the parking lot, started messing up. So that was kind of nice that it happened right then. Uh, but we hooked up our scan tool and checked for codes. So there's the vehicle there. It's a 6.6 turbo. We went and did the code scan. And we ended up with two pages of codes. Most of the codes in there were U codes. So U codes are network communication codes. And then if we look down here, we got a 101, lost communication with transmission, lost PCM. Lost PCM, class two data circuit malfunction right here. So that's where we're going to start with that U1000. We're going to take a look. We're going to uh, go to OEM testing and see what it says. It says module connected to the class two serial data circuit monitor for serial data communications during normal vehicle operation. Operating information and commands are exchanged among the modules. When a module receives a message for a critical operating parameter, the module records the ID number of the module which sent the message for state of health monitor. So if it doesn't find that and it doesn't, uh, it's not able to find that module, then you're going to get a code. Um, so conditions for setting this code is a node alive message. So in other words, the module has not communicated that it's working. If it hasn't been received from an unidentified module in the last five seconds after establishing communication, then it will just say, hey, uh, we have a problem. When that happens, the module is going to use a default value for whatever missing parameters that were needed. So this is where you might get, if you're looking at scan tool data, it's just going to use a substitute data value. And then that could be a problem as well when you're going to diagnose it if you didn't realize that this was the problem. Uh, so we're going to hook up a scan tool and we're going to see if there are any codes in this range here with history data. Yes, we did. So we're going to go to the DTC list. 
And then we, the first one we came up with, the lowest number was 101. So we're going to go in there. And it says uh, different problems that could happen. Voltage applied to the modules is normal. Engine needs to be running. And that's going to give them a message that hasn't been received. All right. So we do the diagnostic system check. Would you be scanning the vehicle? Uh, we went to install a scan tool, retrieve DTCs. Is 0073 set as current? No, it is not. So we go to step three. Uh, it says turn the ignition on, the engine off, and the following circuits in the module not communicating on the bus for open or shorter ground. So we're going to check battery positive, battery positive, out inputs and outputs, ignition voltage inputs and outputs, and so on. Or instead of going through all that and testing all those different things, why don't we just look at the bus and see what's going on? Now, in this case, it's a single wire bus uh, on the vehicle, and here's what it looked like when it was communicating. And we can see that doesn't quite look right, does it? Doesn't quite look right. It's supposed to look like a square, but instead it looked like this. So what this indicates, and this can be useful for many different signals. If it's a signal that pulls down to ground, if it looks like this, where it kind of curves when it's pulling down to ground, that means that it's taking a very long time to get to ground. Because what is a scope if, if uh, it's a value over time, right? So this one actually made it to ground. This one never made it at all because it was it was too long of uh, too short of a pause between here. So it's coming down and it's just not making it to ground, not making it to ground. So that is a problem on the ground side. It's not able to pull it down fast enough to pull it down to ground. Uh, so that is an issue. Like I said, it is a seven volt differential though. So there's your seven volts at the top, zero volts at the bottom. Uh, in this case, it makes it down to 0.69 volts, which is not far enough to, uh, that, that's enough to cause an issue. Uh, so we went and uh, dis, uh, it says go in and try and find and disconnect, inspect the harness connectors, disconnect things, try and find the module that's not communicating. Uh, what we did instead is we had this uh, tool that unfortunately they don't make anymore, but it was a data bus fault finder. And what it does is it, it checks the bus for power, it shorts the power, shorts the ground. So we see in the middle it says short to ground. And then we have three modules that also say short to ground, look kind of like this. So uh, the green lights on the bottom means the module is connected to the network. And then we see we have a bus short to ground. We have one, two, three modules that says short to ground. So in this case, we have the TCM, the PCM, and the BCM are those three modules right there. So D, F, and H. Uh, so the problem lies in one of those three. Now, the nice thing is we can use the buttons that are on this to take that module off the bus and then check it with the scope. So we have the scope hooked up and we went through one by one, turn them on, turn them off. When we finally got to the transmission control module, it looked like this, looked the way it was supposed to. Um, so we knew that at that point that the transmission control module was the one with the problem. It was the one screwing up the bus. Kind of made sense with the shifting problem, but you never know. Could have been the PCM as well. So when the TCM, as I said, was taken offline, a good pattern showed up. New TCM was ordered, installed and set up. And then we check back to the information to verify the repair again. And it says, make sure there's no DTCs after it was cleared, after we road tested it, drove it, nothing left, no codes. And that is case closed. So let's go live and look at some, uh, some wiring diagrams and some other things that we can do with the tool. All right, so here's our tool. So let's look through first things first. If I'm going to investigate, if I think I have a network issue on a vehicle, I really need to check a wiring diagram to understand how that network is laid out and how I'm going to access it. So let's pull up a couple of vehicles. We'll start with something super simple like an 05 Jeep Wrangler. Right? So if I go into my repair information, I'm going to pull up our wiring diagrams. And if we just go to our wiring diagrams in general, we can go into the system wiring diagrams and then it's gonna be under, if you're using Shopkey or Mitchell, it's gonna be under computer data line. So it's gonna have a separate data line circuit. So if I open that up, we can see here's the DLC here and this is the entire network on this 05 Jeep. Right, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different modules on there. Uh, let's see, we got ground, ground, power, and then we have some individual wires on their own uh, proprietary network here, the SCI. And then we also have the PCI bus here. So it's going to plug into the computer. It's going to go into each of these modules down here as well. 
Um, and then if we needed to get into, say, the ABS controller is going to be on a different line. So it looks like it's on a K line. And then, uh, yeah, same with this one as well. So uh, this one does have its own proprietary network for uh, like the, the scan tool. Uh, but uh, we can see it's a fairly simple network. It should be, if we do have a network problem, it's going to be a single wire. Not all that complicated. All right, let's change to uh, Subaru. So we talked about the Subaru, how it has two different lines as well, just kind of, kind of like that one. But in this case, it has CAN and a single wire for the uh, scan tool. So if we pull up our your data lines. Once again, it's on a single page. It's got more modules, but it's on a single page. So if we zoom in a little bit and we see the uh, DLC, so we know we got power, uh, four and five are ground, right? Nothing over here. Then we have uh, six and 14, right? So we got six and 14, which is gonna be your CAN bus. So if I zoom out a little bit, uh, we can see the CAN bus kind of go, goes to the ECM and then the uh, VDC module, which is vehicle dynamics control. And then it actually spreads out across all these other modules as well. It just doesn't go through these splices for some reason, the highlights, but it goes through all these modules here. There's a, there's a uh, splice point right here as well, which would be good to know. So if there is a uh, joint connector, in this case, this is on the left-hand side, right above the fuse box. And the little joint connectors in here look kind of like fuses. So one big thing they told did tell us at the uh, the training school is, hey, uh, don't mess around with these because if you unplug something, you might lose communication because it, it really it, it hooks up to the rest of the vehicle in that case. Uh, so all the vehicle communication comes through here. Uh, so if you lose communication the meter, the AC control, the audio, then it's got to go through here. So if that's if that's the point where it stops, you see just by reading this wiring diagram, you see it starts at the DLC and it goes through here. So if I were to have communication with the body control module and all this stuff, but I don't have communication past this block, then I know there's a problem somewhere in the block. And actually the block gives me a test point as well if I know exactly where it's gonna go. So that's kind of nice. Uh, if I reset this though, we'll see we also have, um, gotta re reload this diagram here. So we see we also have this block right here. Now this block, comes from the DLC and that is a single wire that is a K line and it goes into this block as a distribution block. So once again, it gives us a junction point where we can test communication at different modules. And you see in this case, this is the old style single wire point to point to modules to get to the body control module. And then in that case, from the body control module, if I need to communicate with anything else, that's gonna be over CAN. So it's gonna depend on what module needs to communicate as to whether or not it goes over CAN or if it goes over that K line. So we can see it's just the main modules, right? So ECM, TPMS, impact sensor, uh, vehicle dynamics control, transmission, body, and then up here is the uh, airbag. So all the major modules on the vehicle can be accessed through that one line, and then everything else is on the uh, the CAN bus. So you just get, you get to kind of get used to reading through wiring diagrams in order to in order to get here. All right? Let's go to Two more examples on the diagram. So we got the Mustang Mach-E that we looked at earlier. So that's the electric Mustang. And that is going to have, like I said, it's going to have CAN FD in it. So in this case, we have five pages. So it's getting more complex. This is 2023 as I said. So it's gonna be CAN from the, there to the, the uh, gateway module. Then from the gateway module, we have ethernet, one, two, three, four different ethernet um, networks. And then we also have our CAN FD. So it's gonna be this right here. It's gonna be our CAN FD. So the CAN FD in this case, internally in the vehicle only, image processing modules, so that's gonna be for your camera, your front view camera. Uh, secondary onboard diagnostic control module. It's going to go across over here as well. It's going to go in vehicle dynamics control, powertrain control module, uh, evac and fill module, power steering control module, driver status monitor camera. Oh, by the way, that's a thing too. 
where it takes a, uh, takes a picture of your face to make sure you're paying attention. And uh, analog brakes are all on the uh, all, all on the can. And now the can FD, not really as a rule, but just kind of industry wise, is what they've kind of adopted. Is it's usually going to be on like your your major stuff like your ADOS, uh, electric vehicle control modules, that sort of thing. So that's why I picked an, an electric vehicle because I figured they're probably going to have it. In this case, it definitely does. Um, and then one more before we get into actually testing, uh, we'll do this uh, Silverado. So this one is uh, the most complex out of all of these. And I'm sure there's other ones out there that'll uh, be pretty complicated too if you just pull them up. But we only have so much time. So pull up my system wiring diagrams, pull up my computer data lines, and you say there's 13 diagrams, 13 pages of diagram. And then if we look at the DLC, that DLC is full. Every single wire on this diagnostic link connector is used for something. Uh, so there are multiple CAN buses on this vehicle. Multiple, multiple CAN buses. Let's see, what's pin two and pin 10, I believe. So yeah, private serial CAN bus. So that is a, uh, that's a, they're using where the J1850 bus used to be on the pins, uh, two and 10, in order to do a separate CAN bus. So we can see all these modules. Low reference, Ethernet bus, Auto SAR CAN bus, which I think is their Diag bus, uh, private serial CAN, uh, Ethernet bus again. Uh, so lots and lots of different buses coming through this serial data gateway module, which is on the vehicle, and then it disperses throughout the rest of the vehicle. So you can see how it kind of goes out. It, it takes all of these disparate wires coming in, and then really it just goes out to uh, these main couple wires here, really. I mean, there's a couple different modules that are on separate wires, but by and large, it's gonna be through these couple wires here on the AutoSAR. So this is that new uh, Global B, the digital vehicle platform they were talking about uh, that I had that one slide on, can process you know, one, uh, four and a half terabytes of data a second or a minute, whatever it was. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's gonna go, it's gonna go run across here. I'm sure it's gonna run across all 13 pages. And it's gonna go to the other end, wherever that is, oh, I guess. But it's going to end up with a telematics control module, and then it goes out from there. So we have CAN bus 5, CAN bus 6, uh, Ethernet bus 6. So within these vehicles, they're very complex. It's just a whole mess of wires everywhere, Ethernet, CAN bus, multiple buses. As I said, once CAN bus gets too many modules on it, you get start get data collisions and backups. So that's why they started going out into multiple buses. They also went into Ethernet, CAN FD, all these faster technologies inside the vehicle not communicating with the scan. Uh, so sometimes if it's a really complicated network problem, you may have to get in there into the module itself, past the gateway module in order to diagnose. All right, now let's talk about actually diagnosing the problem, right? So I could go into my scope, just straight up, straight into the scope, pull up my lab scope, and then see what I can see. So in this case, it's not quite set up, right? It's set to 10 volts, but it's at 200 milliseconds. And I only have one channel. In this case, I'm testing a CAN bus. So I need to turn on channel two, make sure that's set the voltage as well. 10 volts. Once again, that 200 milliseconds is way too long for a CAN bus because the CAN bus is very high speed. So I usually say start at uh, 10 volts and 100. So there's 10 volts and 100. We can actually see what's going on. Maybe I pull out a little bit further, go to 200. There we go. Now I get a whole pattern. This is a complete block of data, CAN bus data on a on this uh, simulator there so you can see the ones and zeros the bits and bytes if we wanted to analyze this we can kind of set it up like this and see what we got for voltages uh, so it should be about two and a half volts right here it looks like the battery's getting a little low on this thing so it's about 2.36 volts and then when it transmits like i said the high side goes high by about a volt volt and a quarter low side goes low by about a volt volt and a quarter and we can see it's about a volt on either side. So it's 236 to 327, and then 237 down to 138. It's about 9.9 and 0.99 on the two channels. So they should be pretty even. Flat tops, flat bottoms, no noise, uh, no shorts to ground, no shorts to power. So in this case, it looks like everything's good. Now that's a manual setup if I wanted to do that. And I did that pretty quick because you know, I kind of I, I know where I needed to go. 
to understand that. But if you want to learn more about CAM, we can go into guided component tests if you have the tool of the scope. And if we go into classes, uh, under how to here, there should be a CAN bus class in here. It's the first 20 minute class. Let's see, 20 minute CAN bus class right here. So we can talk about basics and fundamentals, bus arbitration, CAN voltages. So we can talk about the different voltage ranges they need to be in, CAN low, CAN high, uh, signal quality, different waveforms. Well, I'll hit back too far. Uh, waveforms. All right, so we can see the different waveforms. Here's good. Here's one with an open. Here's high side with an open. Here's a low side, short to positive, both short to positive, and so on and so forth. So you can see what the different uh, modules look like. Here's one that, uh, depending on where the short circuit is taking place, the test point it may look like this. So it gives you a lot of really good information as to what known good and known bad should look like. Also, if you wanted a general setup for CAN bus, you can go into power user tests. You can do a dual channel test and there's a CAN bus test in there. All I gotta do is hit view meter and it's gonna set it up. Look at that. And it's gonna show us what it's supposed to look like too, which it does. Uh, now I will tell you this extra little bit at the end is not on every manufacturer, depending on how they wanted it set up. So in this case, they call this an act bit or an acknowledgement. So this is the end of the transmission. So I call it like the period at the end of the sentence. So we're gonna tell you all the data you need and then we're here's the end, I'm done. So that's what that is. You may not see that depending on the manufacturer. In this case, I'm hooked up to a BMW. So BMW does that, so that's what it looks like, but it may not in all circumstances have that at the end. So don't worry about it if it does. If you see some spikes in the middle, that's a different story that and it'd probably be up in like the five volt range. Uh, so that would, might be something to worry about. And then you want to look at the tops, make sure they're not all like skewed or messy. Uh, and then the last way we can look it up, other than doing it manually or doing it that way, is we can pull up the vehicle. And the majority of vehicles in the tool that have CAN bus, if you go into engine, you're going to see a test for CAN bus right there. And then there'll be a signature test. And it's going to tell you where to plug it in on the vehicle. In this case, they want to plug it in the ECM. Hit view meter, it's going to hook up, and it's going to display. Uh, I know it's a lot of information to go over. There are other videos that we've done in the past that cover some of this information a little bit more in depth as well. Uh, we just wanted to get some more information out there, especially on like that CAN-FD and some of the newer vehicles that are out there and how complex that they have become. So that is network overview and diagnosis. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about next week. Next week is Security Link. Talking more about Security Link. I know there's a, a lot of confusion out there as to what the manufacturers are doing. How do I how do I set up my tool to work? Why does my tool not work with this certain vehicle or whatever it happens to be? Uh, so we're going to talk in depth about all that Security Link. Are you ready for the new OEM security protocols that are out there? So join me as usual, same time, same place. Uh, 6 and 9 Eastern on Tuesdays. Uh, go to snapon.com slash OT if you want to register and join on Zoom. Otherwise, the 6 p.m. Eastern class goes to YouTube. The 9 p.m. class goes to Facebook. Facebook.com slash snaponjason is my handle there. And then our YouTube channel is youtube.com slash snapondiagnostics. And uh, make sure you give a like and subscribe if you're over there. Also, if you want to see any of our past topics in this series, right, we've been doing this for a few years, Anywhere from intro to ADOS down to you know, power sure track, data component testing, et cetera. It's all there. It's all free. It's all readily available on there is a playlist for live training available there. As for questions, if you do have any questions, uh, as I said, this is a pre recorded session this week. So if you do have any questions uh, on Zoom, just reply to your email that you got, a confirmation email, and uh, we'll get to those questions. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, just leave a comment. And I'll get to those questions when I can as well. Also want to make sure I mention my buddy Keith Ray, who does free training as well. His is scan tool based training. Every Wednesday is going to be on Zeus and every Thursday is going to be on Apollo and Triton. They're about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes or so long. First hour is going to be setup functions. Let's set up your Wi-Fi. Let's talk about security link. Let's talk about um, uh, snap on cloud and things like that. And then he goes through the scanner. Uh, talk about all the different functions in there and fast track intelligent diagnostics. Then he takes a little break. 
And then he goes through the scope and meter functions again for about another half hour, 40 minutes after that on their respective tools. So if you want to sign up for that, snapon.com slash OT to register for those classes as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for taking a little bit of time out of your day to spend a little bit of time with me. Uh, hopefully learned a little bit more about vehicle networks and uh, and the complexities involved there. It, it is able to be tested. You just kind of need to know what, you, what you're looking for. Source of power, source of ground, noise, things like that. Uh, so with that, once again, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. Have a good night and take care.